welcome everybody along to um, the coaching corner this 6th of May, uh, back after Easter break. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, I do want to let you all know that um, we are recording the session. You can access this and watch this again, as well as any past episodes um, on our website. You just look under the resources tab. Uh, I do need to uh, acknowledge our sponsors. Philips Ultrasound has, or Philips Healthcare has uh, kindly sponsored and makes the Coaching Corner possible. So um, hats off to them and a big thanks for their support. Now tonight we have joining us um, James, Ferry, James Ferry, who is a podiatrist and Associate Professor Mark Gilheny, who's a podiatric surgeon. And they are going to talk about the fast ankle assessment. So we have James to go to right now and he'll take you through a fast it's a cheeky play for the uh, emergency docs here but um, it's um, we're going to talk about ankle assessment in an emergency kind of situation or acute ankle injury and then Mark and James will go through some case studies so I'm going to um, throw to you now James yep. and then we'll get started there we are Perfect. Okay. I'll um, share my screen. Okay, there we go. Perfect. So hopefully um, what I can demonstrate tonight is really the utility of um, point of care ultrasound in, in an acute and subacute um, setting to screen for significant ankle injury. Um, and we've got Mark Gilheny, podiatric surgeon, um, who will great opportunity to discuss some of these cases because quite a few of these um, cases will demonstrate Mark was involved in their care. So it'll be interesting to talk through that. Um, so that really the, the problem that we're trying to sort of answer clinically is the swollen, painful ankle following an acute injury. And these can sometimes be difficult in a you know, in an acute setting, because when there's quite a lot of swelling present, there can be quite a lot of areas that are tender. Um, and what we're wanting to do, and, and where I found ultrasound really useful for these patients is really to provide, you know, immediate answers to the clinical questions that, that I've got, which are, is the bone involved? Are we dealing with a fracture? Are we dealing with more of a ligament pathology or potentially a, a joint problem such as a syndesmotic injury or, or an osteochondral lesion? And although ultrasound is not necessarily a, a primary tool for joint pathology, um, when I see quite a large joint effusion around an acute injury, I have quite a high suspicion for a, a syndesmotic injury or a, or a tailor dome injury as well. And it can be really useful having um, ultrasound in the clinic because it, it, it avoids that delay in that initial management. So you can start making clinical decisions to guide treatment in that first consultation without necessarily awaiting um, while, while waiting for an X-ray if needed. And I think since I've been using um, point of care ultrasound in the clinic, it's drastically reduced the number of X-rays that I refer for in acute settings um, because you can quite clearly, and with this technique, I'll demonstrate how you can quite clearly visualize um, bone and check for fracture and also more significant pathology. Um, and I think that ultimately comes to a reduced cost of unnecessary MRIs. Um, and all of these cases hopefully share something in common where they've been, in, in most of them, we've been able to quite readily identify a fracture or a significant injury in, in quite a quick manner. Um, so really the approach with this is we're gonna use um, effectively bony landmarks such as the um, lateral malleolus, the medial malleolus and the um, styloid process on the fifth. They're really easy bony landmarks to place your transducer. And the thing I enjoy about ultrasound is it really integrates well into your clinical assessment. So I still perform a clinical assessment. You take a, a thorough history and clinical assessment. But in cases where you've got some where there's quite a lot of tenderness um, or it's difficult to perform that assessment um, clinically at the start, ultrasound can be useful. It gives you that added advantage of being actually able to see the bony cortex and so forth. 
And this particular model, even if you don't have advanced musculoskeletal skills, it's still reasonably easy to perform. So as I mentioned, an ankle joint effusion um, can be helpful. I um, mean, that's often what we're sort of primarily looking for in this case is this is more of a screening method, not necessarily looking for, is there an ATFL rupture or a, a, a deltoid ligament um, crush injury? We're really looking for, is there a fibular fracture, tibia fracture? Is there a significant ankle joint effusion? Um, because if there is, I'll have a high suspicion for a, a syndesmotic injury or a, a fracture inside the joint. And we can also check the fifth metatarsal as well. So when I do more of a complete ankle scan, I usually start off by this looking at the syndesmoses and by dorsiflexing the ankle, you can also put the syndesmoses under a little bit of um, uh, tension and that can be helpful dynamically. I then move on to the um, ATFL and the calcaneofibular ligament. And if I don't find any pathology there, I'll tend to look at the ankle joint. And again, I'm really looking for, is there an ankle joint effusion or not? And commonly, if you don't find any injury around the ankle, the bifurcate ligament can be involved and the patient may have suffered a small avulsion fracture. So there's two components to that bifurcate ligament, the calcaneocuboid and the calcaneonavicular. Um, and it's not uncommon to find a small little avulsion fracture of either the um, anterior process of the calcaneus or the um, cuboid. And when someone's had more of a complete injury and they've damaged and you've had quite a significant disruption to the um, uh, anterior talofibular ligament and the calcaneofibular ligament, these patients can often, I'll often scan the medial joint, particularly the posterior aspect of the um, deltoid ligament can become crushed. When the ankle moves into an extreme um, inverted position, the medial malleolus can collide with the talus and, it's, um, and, and these patients can develop a pommy lesion or a posterior medial ankle impingement. Um, and again, you can find a small little avulsed fracture um, in that area. So some of the tips for this is um, using a MSK or a small parts preset, a high frequency linear transducer. Um, the depth, most of these are quite shallow, which makes visualizing the bone um, quite nice. And you can use the bony landmarks that you can palpate, such as the fibula, um, the lateral malleolus or the um, styloid process on the fifth. And if there is any areas that look abnormal, you know, the ability to use your probe to palpate and to sonopalpate can be really helpful to try and differentiate is this um, sort of abnormal anatomy or are we dealing with actual pathology? And the ankle can be uh, quite bony in some people, so lots of gel helps. And in particular, a good quality gel. Around, for MSK stuff around the ankle, I really, um, you want a, quite a viscous um, gel. If it's some of the gels that I've bought in the past, you end up throwing them all out because it's just too runny and it's, it makes scanning quite difficult. And um, the power Doppler can be really useful because whenever we've got a fracture, there is often um, an increase in hyperemia around that fracture and that shows up really nicely on um, Doppler. And again, useful to scan in both long axis and short. So hopefully we can demonstrate some of these in case studies. Um, the first case study was a 58 year old um, female patient. She lives alone, works in administration, no relevant medical history. She actually presented to her chiropractor complaining of a sore back, but several days before, um, before this, she tripped at home during the COVID lockdown and she complained of quite severe pain and felt faint. She was unable to weight bear immediately after her injury. She presented initially to um, ED complaint, um, where she was diagnosed with an ankle sprain. I think a few days later, that particular ED had an outbreak of COVID. Um, so that may have been one of the reasons she was moved through quite quickly. Um, so within a pretty short period of time, within really 15 seconds of putting a probe onto this patient, we can quite clearly see a disruption in that normal bony cortex with a small effusive dome there. As I scan down and we're scanning down and looking at the syndesmosis in short axis, we can see the fibula to the um, 
right of screen and the tibia to the left, we can see that um, hyperechoic um, fragment and also some hematoma around that area. And the X-ray demonstrates a nice fracture of the fibula. And um, Mark, this particular patient, um, I sought your specialist opinion. Um, could you talk me through um, your approach and decision-making in her case? Um, James, am I on mute or am I? No, we can hear you. You can. Um, so this particular person presented as a little bit of a challenge, if I remember correctly, she was living alone, as you said, yep. and there were mobility issues and we didn't have a lot of displacement in the fracture. What's fascinating to me about it is that you were able to, you know, pick up this fracture quite quickly and the X-ray was then obtained to confirm later on. So the value of the ultrasound was quite apparent. Um, the choices here for somebody with this type of level of mobility, um, her age, and most significantly were her social circumstance. Realistically, the level of displacement um, uh, the, the lack of significant uh, ligamentous uh, disruption suggested that she could be managed conservatively. Um, so we did talk her through this. From my perspective, the main issue in these sorts of circumstances is to make sure that physiologic tension is not increased by immediate load bearing, which can cause either further damage or um, delay healing. And so getting this diagnosis and seeing this person before there was significant displacement or significant ongoing damage meant that we could start to look at protected load bearing. We negotiated with her effectively um, because the different ways you can look at immobilization are quite varied and it ranges from a, you know, a full encircling cast, a back slab, a cam walker, uh, a, a crutches, uh, some people um, use braces and the like, but our real concern here was that, yes, it doesn't need surgical reduction, um, but how are we going to immobilise it effectively in a way that she can manage? Um, and we trialled her with a cam walker, correct me if I'm wrong, initially, yeah, that, yep. um, <clears throat> which uh, we talked about as a means to fit in with her the restrictions of her life and her circumstance, but on the condition that we were closely monitoring her over the next two to three weeks to make sure that there was no further displacement, either with uh, further ultrasound or with further with it, with X-ray, and then based on the lack of further displacement, we were happy to maintain that level of mobility for her and then return her to rehabilitation. Um, I'm concerned as well that we have adequate compression as part of the protection mechanism, which also reduces edema, which also helps with far faster recovery. And I'm also concerned that some of these cases, if they're missed, can lead to protracted painful recoveries when really a period of early um, uh, negotiated uh, immobilization is what they need. Uh, then of course, allowing for uh, education on medical complications such as potential DVT and the like, which we're also at pains to ensure we do and use prophylactic measures as, as, as indicated uh, with any form of lower limb immobilization. Yeah, because I, I remember this particular patient, she was walking around on this for yeah, about three right. days after the injury. And um, yeah, she presented initially to the, to the chiropractor complaining of a sore back from the limping. Um, and I think around management as well, her primary concern when we were negotiating management was who could walk her dog. That was, that was the biggest thing she was worried about in that consult. I think, I think the clue there is it's a natural human thing to underestimate or undersell injury. You know, it, yes, it hurt, but gee, I can weight bear on this. Can't be too bad. I've, I've got a busy life, I'm living on my own, I've got my dog to look after. Um, you know, I've gone to emergency, they didn't seem to think it was a problem. So you get this kind of circumstance where she's effectively 
not educated or aware of the potential severity and the potential long-term adverse sequelae of an unstable ankle or a non-healing uh, ankle fracture or a non-union. So a, a big component of this uh, is a pick up diagnostically, but then the education and then the shared decision-making with the patient. And that's really what we were doing together was looking at a shared decision protocol with the individual. And um, uh, that worked extremely well. And she was very compliant as soon as she understood what we were trying to achieve. She understood the nature of her injury um, and she's progressed to a, an uneventful uh, sequelae and full mobility. Perfect. We'll um, move on to the next case. So um, this particular patient, um, a 58-year-old uh, female patient, depression, she was under investigation for some balance problems, question mark, um, vertigo. Um, she presented initially after an inversion injury. Um, she was suffering with some mild pain and swelling. Um, it was two weeks after her initial injury. She wasn't limping and there was some focal pain on palpation of the um, fifth net around the styloid process. Again, on, on uh, uh, ultrasound, we could really quite um, readily detect a um, avulsion fracture of the um, base of the fifth metatarsal. So again, this is a really um, where, based on a clinical assessment, we can feel there's a focally tender area within 15 seconds of putting the ultrasound on that area, a nice visible fracture is, is seen. And you can see in this particular view, the perineus brevis tendon inserting into that styloid process. Um, and often with fractures that have a little bit of displacement, you can see that sort of hyperechoic artifact um, as opposed to the acoustic shadowing that we normally get with a, with a bony type issue. And um, I think again, in this case, we can see the x-rays here where it looks reasonably displaced in this one. Um, and again, you're involved in this one too, Mark. And I'm just wondering, um, in terms of this particular case, your approach to managing it, but also fifth metatarsal fractures, particularly around the base, whether it's a Jones fracture, avulsion fracture, has the way you approach those changed over the years? Um, do you manage them any differently to you did 15 years ago? Has anything changed in, in that respect? And yeah, how do you approach those? Um, yes, it's changed. Um, I think that more broadly, the discussion the, the common theme here is picking up fractures late and the value of, of your diagnostic skills. Um, I think the concern we have here is identifying whether we're dealing with a true Jones fracture, which is really a bit more distal down the fifth metatarsal than at that point. Uh, and then if we have got a more proximal styloid type fracture of this nature, assessing the level of displacement, whether it's intra-articular versus non-articular, non uh, what the level of displacement is, and then looking at the soft tissue attachments. So there is certainly literature that says the results of functional rehabilitation, so early weight bearing after these fractures is as good as um, immobilization, and that tends to be the trend at the moment. The concern I have with some of these circumstances is that uh, we're seeing patients come into the clinic post these fractures where they've been encouraged to go towards early, early mobilisation, who are several months post injury, still with grumbling pain with a very, very slow healing fracture. Um, so I, my protocol for this is still to accept that you've got perineus brevis pulling on that fragment. It's unstable because of this during functional load tissue, ligament or bone cannot heal quickly or effectively if it's under adverse traction. You need to somehow reduce that tension for a period of time to try and encourage healing. So I still favour, if I pick these up, a period of uh, compression support and immobilisation um, 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 to the point where I can reduce or eliminate deforming force in the first two, two weeks in particular. After that point, there's generally a, a, a enough uh, healing in place that you can start gradual rehabilitation and moving forward. So despite the sort of variances and trends, 
I think my perspective is I'm seeing too many people come into my office who are complaining of significant pain months afterwards when realistically, if they'd had a short period of slightly more aggressive immobilization than carefully planned rehabilitation, they wouldn't be in that position. They'd be functional without pain within four to six weeks rather than being not really functional and in pain for sometimes four. I've seen them six months down the track. Um, the other thing that we, you, we've used effectively, James, and you'll remember, and I don't know if it's relevant specifically to this case, is that if you're in doubt as to whether this is functionally stable, a nice trick is to dynamically test it under ultrasound. So there was one of these fractures that came in that you have the example. I don't know if you have it on this series or not. I've that... got it at the end. I, I okay. sort of All put right. it in well, at the end it. in case yeah, we, well, we wanted can, to get we can, there. I was just, just mentioning that, that yeah. you can also use point of care ultrasound to assess the level of healing in some of these fractures where you have large muscles attaching to what could be an unstable fragment. Um, radiologic healing will be apparent long after clinical healing. So having the capacity to test clinical healing through something like point of care ultrasound is, is, is very valuable in yeah. tracking and, and telling you when you can rehabilitate them more. Yeah, I think one of them, um, I think it was question mark as sort of a Jones fracture that was referred to you where we um, did some dynamic testing of that and it was it was really quite stable. And I think that correlated well to the patient symptoms, which were progressing well. Yes, but but was that the one, and then we see this sometimes too, where once they, once they started to increase their rehab, mm. the individual started to develop some pain in the area. And that's often the case once you've got an area of healing bone and you start to load it again, you'll get some discomfort. And that, um, was that, was that, I think that might have been that one. And the question was whether or not, even though radiologically there may not be complete union noted whether yes. it was clinically stable yep and that's it's right. that concept of treat the patient not the x-ray um, yeah. if it's clinically stable you can continue to load and the x-ray will look after itself and are there any other factors that you um, typically find as being sort of risk factors for sort of non-union these injuries ending up quite protracted um, look, I, th I, th I think not, not reducing that, that, that tension, that adverse traction and tension in, in the early phase after injury is, 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 is critical. But then, of course, you come into some of the other factors that are uh, lifestyle driven, like smoking is a, a, a terrible one for, for fractures in the foot and ankle. You also have issues that can affect your negotiation on what you're going to do to try and rehab them and, and immobilize them, such as obesity, osteoporosis, uh, you know, the, the list goes on. How is, what, what's their bone metabolism like? You know, what are their vitamin D levels like? Uh, you know, it, it goes on, it goes on. Do they need an endocrinologist to help them with their bone, their, uh, their bone health in a sense? Uh, so I think that taking the time to get to know the patient, and this is one of the things that we, really try to do is and, and would encourage people to do is look at the x-ray look at the scan result by all means but then take quite a bit of time to talk to the patient and get to know them it's it is part of that subtle gathering of medical history but uh you know that's that's what will generally help you set forward a management plan for them if you know the person that's attached to that injured part yep definitely so the next case study um, we've got, this is a 23-year-old semi-professional soccer player and he'd um, injured his ankle. It was a twisting motion um, while kicking at practice. It was a non-contact injury. It was immediately swollen and, and, I, and I saw this particular patient. Um, he was referred by uh, his chiropractor two weeks after the, the initial injury still unable to, to, to run on it. There was some preliminary x-rays done and there was nothing obvious on there. There was a small little loose body at the front of the um, ankle joint, but there was also a little bit of a bony tuft as well on the neck of the talus. So I think this patient had had a previous history of, of ankle sprains. Um, having a look uh, at the front of the ankle joint, I'm just assessing for, a, for an ankle joint effusion. We can see 
a, um, a reasonable effusion here with, a, with that little loose body that was also evident on the X-ray, which was quite subtle on the X-ray we can see. But effectively to the left of screen, we've got the front and the anterior tibia, and we've got our talus underneath. And when we're looking for an effusion, we basically are looking for a collection, an anechoic or a hypo hypoechoic collection at the front of that ankle joint. Um, moving on and having a look at the syndesmosis or the, uh, the anterior inferior tibiotalar ligament, we can see that's sort of grossly swollen. And we've got this um, mixed echogenicity sort of mass in that area now. So that's quite consistent with a hematoma. If I show you the contralateral side, you can see the same sort of thing, but we can see a nice, clear, crisp, um, hyperechoic ligament that's intact in this case. Um, and the interesting thing with this one is, I can demonstrate on here, this is actually a stress test. So I actually had this patient weight bear, and I had them dorsiflex their ankle and move into um, a little bit of internal rotation so that I could assess the stability of that syndesmosis. Um, it's also it's also not common not not commonly done, but you can also assess the posterior ankle joint and the um, posterior um, part of the syndesmosis as well. So this one's sort of an, an an interesting one in terms of demonstrating sort of dynamic evaluation. Mark, do you think there's much role for dynamic evaluation in assessing these sort of syndesmotic injuries? <laughs> You'll, th these are called leading questions, James. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Look, absolutely. As you know, we work we work closely together, and um, uh, I, I, as time goes on, I'm increasingly convinced of the value of that, um, mm. and it's one of the, tr the the great advantages of of, of of ultrasound is being able to assess dynamically and look at how the anatomy is performing, and then combine that with a a, a good clinical understanding of the patient and their musculoskeletal injury. And you will pick up these little subtle problems that you just can't pick up otherwise. You, you, just, you just miss them. Um, and these types of chronic ankle pain issues, you, you could come up with 20 different examples of these small little problems that you will pick up. And we do pick up, we see them constantly um, that we can only do if uh, we can only see if you're doing this dynamic load and dynamic testing. Um, so the last, um, the last one, and it's actually, sorry, it's, it's not a cuboid fracture. Um, this one just presented the other night and it was a, it was a presented after, you know, six o'clock at night. It was a 35 year old patient who I'd seen previously. Um, she reported an inversion ankle sprain and she said that she passed out at the time of the injury. She felt a little bit embarrassed. She didn't present to, a, to an ED and had just sort of rested it over the past few days. She presented with um, uh, sort of moderate, mild to moderate pain, but quite a lot of swelling. And she was probably more concerned with the swelling. She was able to walk without a limp, um, but she was quite surprised that her ankle felt quite her ankle felt good, even though she felt like she sprained her ankle. And in this case, um, we're actually looking more in the midfoot. I was suspecting more that she'd have a fifth met fracture when I was taking her history. But um, when I scanned the fifth metatarsal, there was no evidence of a cortical break. And as I moved further up, what I could see is at the fourth um, tarsometatarsal joint, there was a small avulsion fracture where a small fragment of the cuboid has come away, um, which was quite, which was, you know, again, I think it's just a, an interesting case to highlight how useful point of care ultrasound is in that sort of clinical circumstance. When you've got someone who presents with a, you know, an acutely swollen, painful foot after an injury, and these sort of small fractures, I don't think I've ever, they're very, very difficult to pick up on x-ray. And in this case, um, we probably as well save the patient the need for necessarily an MRI or a bone scan if we can, you know, I'm going to monitor this patient over the next um, week or so. And if she's, you know, progressing well with the, with the treatment regime, we'll, we'll sort of continue with that. Um, 
James, I think one of the important things to points to make there is in terms of your 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 you're curious as to how ultrasound can be used in musculoskeletal medicine in these areas. Mm. It really does guide therapy. If you are finding a fracture of that type, there's an awful lot of these cases that are managed via various forms of physical therapy and or pharmacologic management. Uh, patients uh, are spending a lot of time with therapists and a lot of money and people are not realising that there's these small yeah. fractures which are very prone in the foot. If you've identified that, the only treatment algorithm is we need a couple of rest of weeks of protected load bearing. We don't need anything else. And yeah. if we do that, the patient will come good and they don't need all of these other expensive interventions and or uh, imaging techniques. And then once you've given the body a chance to primarily heal from what is a severe assault, you know, that's a bony uh, fracture or an assault, if it's protected, it'll calm down and it'll heal but it's going to take the patient three or four weeks before they start to feel a bit better. Mm. And this, and then it's a, a good educative tool. So you can say to the patient, look, you know, it's not a serious fracture. It's just a small little, a small little break in your foot, but it doesn't matter what you do. It's going to hurt for a few weeks and you need to back off your activity. Yeah. Uh, and that's in my experience, the most invaluable advice you can give any patient is knowledge. Yep. I agree. The, the last, um, that's an extremely valid point. The last patient I saw with a similar type fracture, she'd actually had presented initially to her GP who ordered an x-ray and an ultrasound. And there was a small avulsion fracture of the cuboid. Um, two weeks later, she was still having um, quite persistent pain and she'd been referred to physio at that point. So you had a physio loading the foot and she was in increasing pain and having um, difficulty doing that. So that was her sort of reason. And she, she again, only ended up coming to see me because I think her chiropractor recommended that because her foot wasn't feeling better with physio, maybe she should just get a second opinion. But that was a really good example of exactly what you said. These sort of patients, sometimes if it's not, if the x-ray is cleared, they move into the sort of physical therapy pathway. And if there is a small niggling fracture, it just tends to, um, you know, they feel like they're going crazy because they're not progressing. They're having increasing pain um, performing that. Um, this is actually, this is that case we were talking about before where we actually had a small, um, where we were sort of stress testing that um, fifth metatarsal mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're really the main cases. Um, I'm just wondering as well, We've we've been we've had ultrasound in the clinic. Has there been a um, most people have used sort of point of care ultrasound? There's often a, a specific case they can remember where it really did impact um, management and really impact that you know that patient and that that care. Is there any cases that that you know that come to front of mind um, with ultrasound of your own patients that it really has made a difference in in an outcome? Oh, look, you know, I think there's been a, a, a lot uh, dragging the memory cells. You know, it's not just ankle, it's, it's forefoot. There was one I remember that was referred to me for consideration to surgical excision of a neuroma in the forefoot, um, the symptoms of which, to my mind and experience, didn't really fit with the uh, uh, presentation and uh, imaging to date. And I remember dragging you in saying, I think we've got a stress fracture here. Mm. And the ultrasound picked up a fourth metatarsal Salt. stress fracture, uh, which, you know, again, other practitioners had seen this person, were convinced that it was neuroma, were sending the patient to me for surgical opinion slash excision. Um, patient was expecting that. And we were able to send the patient home saying, look, you need some padding under your foot to offload this. It'll get better in three to four weeks. Uh, that's all you need. Uh, that's what happened. And the patient was extremely happy. But, but um, you know, it's, 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 and there are, there, there, there are several of those, you know, and we, we, we yeah. come across this all the time. Perfect. Well, um, that sort of concludes our case study, Sue Ann. Thanks, Mark and James. That's been um, fantastic. I think for me, I'm looking at this and thinking there's 
there's a number of those little niggly injuries that um, could take a very different path. And I, I particularly appreciate the <laughs> ultrasound can make this so simple to set them on the right treatment path. And that could save lots of pain, better recovery, but also um, make a big difference to the hip pocket. And there are a lot of patients yep. who pay for a lot of treatment that actually doesn't help because it's been misdiagnosed or, or sent in the wrong direction to start with. So, um, yeah, I, has anyone in our audience today got any questions for Mark or James? Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, this is Brian Doyle, um, I'm an emergency physician from Hobart. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Brian. Hi, Brian. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, quick question. I was, I was quite intrigued. I mean, I have to admit, uh, with these ankle injuries in the emergency department, you know very well we can be rather lazy in the emergency department. Basically, just get an x ray in the fast track. If the bone's broken, mm -hmm. refer them to the uh, fracture clinic, or if it's unstable, maybe to the orthopedist emergently. And if it's not broken, well, then just, you know, hey, good luck. But uh, there are, there's a lot of times where we'll have uh, an injury and we'll clinically suspect potentially an occult fracture, in particular to the metatarsals. It, you know, I was kind of intrigued by your ability to kind of look uh, at the metatarsals themselves and, and find potentially what could be um, an occult fracture. It's, a lot of times we'll send them for CT scans, but do you think there's a role for um, ultrasound in trying to find these occult fractures acutely? Yeah, definitely. Um, I find most of the stress fractures, I've found quite a number of stress fractures um, with ultrasound. It's really easy to image um, it's, it's quite an easy, because they're just a, a nice long bone. Um, it's harder to, you need a little bit more, it's a little bit more difficult looking through the midfoot joints because, but, but particularly the metatarsals, I think ultrasound has a, a, has a huge role in being able to pick up these of, you know, fr fractures. James, could you uh, comment for Brian in terms of uh, the type of ultrasound machine that, you know, the unit that would work in his sort of environment potentially? Yeah, so look, really most point of care systems will be fine just using a high frequency um, linear transducer. Um, the technique I sort of use is I'll start off in short axis. So if you really want to confirm, you know, if you, if you suspect that it's in the third metatarsal, I'll usually start from either medial or lateral. S start in short axis on the metatarsals and sort of count as you go across. And then when you get to the metatarsal you're interested in, then I just turn into long axis and then basically start from the MTP joint and just move um, in a systematic way just up to the tarso metatarsal <laughs> joint. That's sort of the, that's the, the general technique, or you can use the toe as well. You can place it down on the toe, um, wiggle the toe so you can see that the MTP joint, you're on the right metatarsal and just move the, um, move the transducer sort of slide up. What about the tarsal bones of the foot? Are they equally easy to image and uh, get your head around? Yeah, the, tar the tarsal bones, um, as a, I, I would tend to use the metatarsals as a reference. So, um, as I said, the cuboid, some of the tarsal bones can be a little bit more difficult. What's a really good one is the um, anterior beak of the calcaneus. That's a really common one um, where patients have done an inversion injury and that bifurcate ligament pulls a small fragment off there. Um, that's a really good, that's a, quite an easy one to, to, to look at. Some of the main tarsal bones um, can be a little bit more difficult. Um, but particularly the metatarsals are quite, are quite readily available to image and so is that um, sort of bifurcate ligament. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions for uh, James or Mark? Um, sorry, I don't want to hog the, the, the questions, but uh, in, in the very beginning, you mentioned uh, using hyperemia and your color power Doppler to find yeah. uh, injury. And can, you, you sort of mentioned that, but haven't talked about it. It's quite interesting to hear what you, you uh, think about I that. I do. So um, I've, I actually, you can also, um, hyperemia is really useful. So if you do see that sort of looks like a disruption in the cortex, putting power Doppler on there. Um, nearly all of the acute fractures I've seen, you'll get an increase in signal in that area. Um, so power Doppler can be yeah, really useful for that. You can also monitor the healing of fractures. Generally, as it gets closer to bony union, 
that hyperemia also um, reduces as well. So some of the cases that we talked about where I'd followed them through, even, you know, four to six weeks afterwards, you can still see an increase in, um, in, in hyperemia around the fracture site. And with the, and particularly um, with some of the stress fractures as well, so you really see that um, bone callus as well. Often on a lot of the point of care systems, um, it can be difficult to see the periosteum you know, in normal anatomy. But when you've got a stress fracture, a periosteum becomes um, that sort of hypoechoic um, sort of line over the bony cortex becomes quite obvious. You can often see that sort of bony callus that forms as well. Another little um, trick that you can use as well, there was an interesting case I had, this was through the lockdown and it was a, it was a 40 year old um, lawyer who presented and she was living alone and she was walking. She just decided that she was going to start walking 15 Ks a day. And she presented complaining of heel pain and uh, both her parents are, are physicians. She, her, I think her parents are both specialists. And they suggested she might have plantar fasciitis. She didn't seem to have, taking a history, it sounded like she might have a, a plantar fascial tear. Um, doing an ultrasound, one of the, the useful things there was I was put of anything wrong with the plantar fascia or the Achilles tendon um, so there was no real obvious reason for her pain and on scanning the medial calc uh, the calcaneus there's a subtle decrease in the um, sort of hypoechoic um, cortex of the bone and you can see that rather than getting that normal um, sort of acoustic shadowing there was some penetration through a particular area and putting power doppler on there as well there was a subtle um, increase in hyperemia around that spot and um, ordering an MRI showed a really nice stress fracture through the back of the calc. So even though the ultrasound findings were really subtle, just as a process of elimination of going through and, and seeing that plantar fascia looks completely normal, there's no swelling in the fat pad, um, her, her Achilles tendon insertion was completely normal, no retrocalcaneal bursitis, and there was no sort of obvious um, problem with either of the, the the tendon the medial or lateral so that was another sort of useful one where even on ultrasound the the fracture wasn't sort of grossly apparent but as a bit of a process of elimination and the hyperemia was probably the one thing in that case that um, was 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 a bit more obvious one of the questions we had before the session tonight was around how to use color Doppler and power Doppler and when you might use different things. Um, so color Doppler, um, you know, the blood cells moving towards and away from the probe create a Doppler shift and color Doppler assigns that color um, depending on whether the cells are moving towards or away from the probe and typically red cells towards blue cells away from the probe. Um, or flow away from the probe. If you're using color Doppler, you activate the color Doppler setting. And for most of the things that you're looking at, whether it be hyperemia or neovascularization in a tendon, you need your color Doppler scale quite low. So probably numbers on the side, you see the color box, which has got the red on top, blue on the bottom. And you probably need your numbers under 10 to be able to see stuff. Um, a lot of the like handheld units, the color Doppler is probably not going to be sensitive enough to, to see some of those really, really tiny vessels. If you have power Doppler on your machine, that's kind of assigning in crude terms is assigning color based on the number of cells. And so it's much, much more sensitive to those tiny little vessels and, um, and low flow. And so when you're looking for areas of hyperemia at fracture sites and stuff, if you use the power Doppler, it'll be a much more sensitive tool. So you activate the power Doppler and then your gain button, whether you're in color or power Doppler, your gain button can increase or decrease the signal strength. Um, what you do is wind it up until it kind of flashes at you and then back off until that sort of flash artifact just disappears. And then you know, you have your color gain set correctly. So um, I hope, um, I think John was asking, I was asking that question. Um, John, I think, does that help? Uh, the question that you were asking before the session? Oh, yep. That's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, good. So you, you activate, uh, what machine are you on, John? I'm using the uh, Clarius. 
So um, the if you have color Doppler, your gain button now becomes the color gain button. So yep. wind it up until it flashes at you, then just back it off. Okay. Um, and you need to set your color scale probably less than 10 to have the sensitivity for these very small vessels. But if there's power Doppler available to you, that will be much more sensitive because it, like I said, it just in very crude terms without going into physics and stuff too much, it, it pretty much assigns color based on how many red blood cells there are there. Um, and so when you've got very small vessels or um, very low flow, it's going to be much, much more sensitive. And again, the, the power Doppler gain does the same thing, wind it up until it flashes at you and then just back off until it just disappears and then your color gain is set correctly. Are there any other questions from our audience tonight? Um, hey, can I ask one more question of uh, James? Does the presence or absence of an ankle joint effusion change how you risk stratify your patients? Yeah, so even in the literature, I think there's an eightfold increase of a patient having a syndesmotic injury if there's a serious effusion there. I think that's just based on um, reviewing MRIs. Generally, if I see an effusion, um, in cool joint because it's not common with a normal ankle sprain. So even people that will rupture the ATFL, um, you very rarely find a, an effusion there. So if I see an effusion, the two things that come to mind is either a significant syndesmosis injury or there's an osteochondral injury in there. So I, it, it does sort of change. Um, I'm much more likely to look at ordering an MRI if there's a decent effusion there because I'm more suspicious of, of pathology in the joint. We'll often uh, you, see these effusions on um, on plain radiography, I, but I, I yeah, wonder whether or not right. I should be also taking my ultrasound to, to, to just to double check. Yeah, you can as well. If you get the patient to dorsiflex, um, you can actually scan probably, I'd say maybe 30, 40% of the tailor head. You can actually see the articular cartilage um, across the top of the talus. Um, and there's been, I've had a few cases of, of um, tailodome injuries where you can actually see the, the visible defect in the talus. Um, and you can, you can also see a little loose osseous, that little, um, little fragment osseous body in the um, joint as well. Like I had a syndesmosis injury just the other day and it was only a relatively, um, it was probably, it was sort of a partial thickness one. And there was a very, very small posterior effusion, but there wasn't that sort of significant one where that patient that I demonstrated, that was both involved the posterior um, component and also the anterior component. So it was a bit more of a significant injury and there was a bit more movement on the dynamic as well. But yeah, it, it does change my, um, if I see a, a decent effusion there, I, I tend to have a lower threshold to getting an MRI. Whereas generally, if there's no effusion, I don't tend to. Cool. Does anyone else have any other questions? I might ask you to make me host again there, James. I did. Yeah, you should be host again. All right. So does any others, um, anyone else have any questions? Well, I'd like to thank both James and Mark tonight for um, coming along and sharing their wealth of experience and knowledge with us. And I'd also like to just mention again that our um our sponsors are Philips and that they have been very uh, forthcoming in support to put on the coaching corner. So I do just want to acknowledge uh, Philips Healthcare for their support for this uh, webinar tonight. Our next coaching corner will be the first Thursday of the month at half past seven. Uh, so I think it's the 3rd of June next time. And any questions that you have, the topic's still wide open. So if you can get in touch, um, we can uh, get your question on the menu. Um, if anyone else has anything further to add, feel free. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up here and say good night. Yeah, thanks for hosting that, Sue Ann. Um, and thanks for all the questions and your um, Thursday nights. No worries. Fantastic.